All right, so Anglican history is, is really interesting. And the thing about Anglican history is oftentimes we miss a good swath of it because everyone wants to say, well, the Anglican church started because Henry VIII wanted a divorce. Um, and first of all, we'll talk a bit more about Henry VIII later, but he didn't want a divorce. It was something different than that. But the point I always want to try and get across to people is the fact that Henry VIII didn't start anything. He did not create a new church. There was already a church in England long before Henry VIII, and that church has a long history, and actually a long history of independence. Uh, and so anytime we talk about a history of the English church, we can't start with Henry VIII. That is an important part of the history, but it's not the beginning. And actually, the beginning of the English church goes way, way back to the very earliest days of Christianity. Now, there is a, uh, there's a legend, and there's no historical evidence for this legend. Uh, and so my friends who are history professors hate it when I tell this story because it's not good history, but it is a good story. Uh, but the, the legend is that Joseph of Arimathea was a tin trader. And he did a lot of work in what is now England, Great Britain. And he's actually the one responsible for bringing the gospel to England in the first century. Now, that's a great story. Um, I'm not sure if it's true. But at any rate, we know that Christianity came to England very early on. It may not have been the first century. But we do know that in the year 44, there was a Roman conquest of Britain. And so the assumption is that Christianity arrives perhaps around this time in England. Uh, so, so the history of Anglicanism goes back to the, to the earliest Christians. So we have a very long history. We don't see a whole lot of historical evidence for Christianity in England until we get to the Council of Nicaea in 325. And we're pretty sure that the Council of Nicaea was attended by British bishops. So this means that Christianity by 325 is not only in England, but it's already well established if they had bishops that had been invited to the Council of Nicaea. Uh, and we do know that the Nicene Creed and the council's decisions are accepted in Britain. So that's about all we know of the earliest years of Christianity. But like I said, it's, it's important to understand that this is a historic Christianity that goes back to the earliest days of the church. We have a little more information from this next era, the era of the Celtic monk missionaries. So in 432, Patrick, who is a Briton from a clerical family and himself an escaped Irish slave, returns to Ireland as bishop. So Patrick had been kidnapped, taken to Ireland and enslaved. And he was rescued, came back, was ordained to the priesthood, and eventually became a bishop, and returned to Ireland to bring the gospel to the land of his captors. Uh, and so we know that Patrick organizes, evangelizes, helps the poor, and confronts the Druid sorcerers, and he earns both respect and political power in Ireland. In 457, Victorious of Aquitaine introduces a new method of dating Easter, which is accepted in Rome and Gaul, but not in Britain. And so this effectively cuts the British church off from the church on the continent of Europe. And the reason this is important is because we need to remember that Great Britain is, it's an island nation. And so they've always had an independent spirit. Um, we see that even today with the whole Brexit thing. England has never wanted to be under the authority of, of anyone else. And so we see in these early days of the Christian church, uh, 
the English Christianity developed on a somewhat separate track than Roman Christianity. So this idea that it was just the Catholic Church and then the English Church broke away isn't really true. There was always this independent uh, nature of the English Church and of English Christianity. In 663, we have the Synod of Whitby. And at the Synod of Whitby, the English Church uh, decides to conform to Roman rather than Celtic practices. So it's at this point that the English Church comes under the authority of the Roman Church. So notice, it's 663. Uh, so that means there's been roughly 600 years of independent development in the English church, separate from the Roman church. And this is important because this is the DNA of English Christianity. And so that will come to bear when we get to Henry VIII. We then enter into the medieval period from 670 to 1400. In 731, the Venerable Bede completes his ecclesiastical history of the English people. And this is the work that popularized the Anno Domini system for dating events. So the system that we currently use for, um, for dating, so the year 2020, and we say, oftentimes people will say 2020 AD. Actually, the, the proper way to say it is to put the AD first, AD 2020, in the year of our Lord 2020. Uh, but that developed in England. In 796, Alcuin, an English deacon and agent of Charlemagne, introduced the Collect for Purity. So this is the Collect that we begin every Eucharist service with, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. So when we pray this prayer, we're praying a prayer with Christians for hundreds and hundreds of years. This prayer has been prayed in English churches since 796. In 1070, Lanfranc, Archbishop of Canterbury under William the Conqueror, establishes the primacy of the See of Canterbury. Now that's referring to the, the geographic area or the diocese um, of Canterbury. A see is the geographic region that a bishop rules over. And so when we talk about the primacy of Canterbury, that the, the spiritual head of the English church is the Archbishop of Canterbury, this is a tradition that dates back to 1070. In 1080, William the Conqueror reminds the Bishop of Rome, AKA the Pope, that the King of England owes him no allegiance. So again, we see this independent spirit of, of the English that they're not going to be beholden to the Roman church. In 1220, Salisbury Cathedral is begun. And the reason Salisbury Cathedral is important is because the order of service that develops here will be the model for Cranmer's Book of Common Prayer. In 1381, so this is long before the beginning of the Reformation, uh, John Wycliffe, who is an Oxford theologian, publishes his confessions denying that the substance of bread and wine are miraculously annihilated during the Eucharist. So he's rejecting the concept of transubstantiation. So this is one of the, one of the key tenets of the Protestant Reformation and this is something John Wycliffe is putting forth in 1381. Uh, in 1382, Wycliffe completes his English translation of the Latin Vulgate, which was the Latin translation of the Bible. Uh, at this time, in the Roman Church, reading the Bible in any language other than Latin was against the law. But again, this is one of the key tenets of the Reformation, that the Bible needs to be in the vernacular so that people can read it. 
So, so often we talk about the, the Protestant Reformation beginning with Luther and his 95 theses, uh, but really the, the seeds of the Reformation were planted in England uh, by Wycliffe in the 14th century. So now we get to the Reformation. And finally, we get to Henry VIII. So you see, there's a long history of English Christianity before Henry VIII. And if you remember nothing else from this class, I want you to remember that English Christianity, that the Anglican Church does not start with Henry VIII. But it does change with Henry VIII. So in 1525, Henry VIII, who long ago got special permission from the Bishop of Rome, a.k.a. the Pope, to marry his brother's virgin widow, Catherine, has been upset because she cannot bear him a son. Now, this perhaps requires a bit of explaining. Um, there's something in Roman canon law known as impediment of affinity. And this is a list of different relations that you can't marry. <laughs> so today we would say, well, someone can't marry their sister or their brother or their first cousin. Th these are impediments of affinity. Uh, under Roman canon law, there were long lists. And actually, if you look in the back of a 1662 prayer book, they'll have on the, the very last page of the prayer book, they have the impediments of affinity and sort of a list of who you're not allowed to marry. And so it wasn't just blood relatives, but if, if somehow uh, families were connected by marriage, that would also set up impediments of affinity. And so under Roman law, for Henry to marry his brother's wife, his brother's wife would have been considered incestuous. Um, now it says here, marry his brother's virgin widow. Um, Catherine and Henry's brother were, they were betrothed to each other when they were very young. They did get married. Um, it's, it's likely that they did consummate that relationship, but she bore no children from that relationship. Uh, and so I think that's why they considered her to be his brother's virgin widow. But the um, the Pope had to grant a special dispensation for that impediment of affinity. Um, now, some people will say, well, what about the leverate right in, in Deuteronomy that says if a, brother, if a brother's wife, if a brother dies, um, if someone dies before his wife has had children, his brother is bound to marry her. That was part of the, the Jewish law, I don't think that was part of the Roman canon law. And so there was some finagling that had to be done in order for Henry to be able to marry Catherine of Aragon. And the problem with the marriage, uh, Catherine was, was a bit older than Henry, um, and she would not give him a male heir. Now, knowing what we know about biology now, we know that that probably had more to do with Henry than with Catherine. But for Henry, and Henry considered himself to be a good staunch Catholic, and Henry thought that the reason he was not able to have a male heir was because the marriage to Catherine was illegitimate, that he never should have done it, and this was God's way of punishing him for an illegitimate marriage. And so what he wanted was not a divorce from Catherine, but rather an annulment for the, for the Pope to say, this was an illegitimate marriage. It never should have happened in the first place. And so Henry and Catherine were never married. And that's the difference between an annulment and a divorce. A divorce says a valid marriage has happened and has been dissolved. An annulment says a valid marriage never happened. So Henry was a good Catholic, didn't believe in divorce. He, he thought he must have done something wrong uh, with this marriage, so he wanted an annulment. Now, it, it doesn't help his case that in the midst of all of this, he falls in love with Anne Boleyn. Um, but the bishop won't grant him the annulment. 
but this is really has more to do with the behavior of powerful men. And I don't know how many of you guys have dealt with powerful men in your lives, but they typically don't like being told that they were wrong. And so for Henry VIII to say, well, this was an illegitimate marriage and never should have been allowed. Um, and I think it's a different Pope at this time, but still the fact that there had been a papal dispensation that Henry is saying, well, I never should have received that dispensation. That doesn't play really well when you're dealing with, with powerful men. So this is really more about a power struggle than it is about theology. Um, so in 1529, Henry decides he doesn't need the permission of the Bishop of Rome to get an annulment. The English church has for centuries operated at an arm's length from the Roman church. And we see that in that, this early history. And so for Henry to declare himself the head of the English church and to cut the English bishops off from Rome wasn't perhaps as far of a leap as we might think it was, because this had been something that was sort of in the DNA of the English church from the beginning. Um, but Henry did not really consider himself to be a reformer. He was not completely on board with all of the things that were going on in the Protestant Reformation over in Europe. There were, there were some things that he was interested in. He kind of waffled back and forth between some of these things. But the, the move that Henry made, it was not uh, a move that was born out of any sort of theological or religious conviction. It was really born more out of a power struggle with the Pope. And because of that, the English church services remain relatively unchanged. Now in 1532, Thomas Cranmer is made Archbishop of Canterbury. And this is important because Cranmer, while Henry VIII is not really a huge fan of the Reformation, uh, Thomas Cranmer is being heavily influenced by the works of uh, Luther and Calvin and all the things that are going on over in Europe. And so one of the things that happens when uh, when Cranmer becomes archbishop is he ends the practice of clerical celibacy. And a few things to, to understand about clerical celibacy. Number one, this is not, again, this is not something that was born out of a theological conviction. Uh, and it's also not something that was historic back to the early days of Christianity. Uh, clerical celibacy didn't come around until I think the 11th, 12th century. And, and the reason for clerical celibacy, well, you ask a Catholic today and they'll say, well, the priest represents Jesus and, and Jesus was unmarried, so the priest is unmarried. Uh, but the reason it started was because bishops were handing down their sees, handing down their authority to their sons. And so it became this sort of hereditary episcopate and so it was a way to end that practice of what, what really looked like a king handing down his, his kingdom to his sons. Um, and then I've got ends in quotes here because even though clerical celibacy was, was a policy in the church for many years, whether or not it was enforced or practiced uh, is debatable. If you read Boccaccio's Decameron, there's all kinds of crazy stories about the things that the priests and the nuns were doing. So uh, celibacy was, was perhaps not as much of a reality as, as we might think. Uh, oftentimes priests would have housekeepers who would wind up with children, and these housekeepers were essentially the wives of the clergy uh, and everything but but name. Um, so Cranmer, who himself is married, ends clerical celibacy in England. In 1536, Henry abolishes all of the English monasteries. And then in 1544, Cranmer is asked to make a prayer book in English based on the service at Salisbury Cathedral. Uh, at this time, different regions of the church all worship 
kind of using different liturgies. There was no standardized liturgy. And one of the things Henry wanted was all of the churches in his realm to worship in common. So when we talk about common prayer, it doesn't mean ordinary or regular. It means it's done in common. He wanted <laughs> all churches worshiping using the same liturgy, but also using the English liturgy. He wanted the people to understand what it was that they were saying. And so Cranmer begins work on the first prayer book, and much of this first prayer book, and we're going to talk about it a little more later, but much of this first prayer book, we still have um, the format, a lot of the prayers, and the makeup in our prayer book today. Uh, so, so the prayer book tradition begins uh, with Cranmer. Now, in 1547, Henry VIII dies, and his son, Edward VI, takes the throne. Now, here's the thing about Edward VI. He was a child, uh, and most children are not ready to rule themselves, much less an entire kingdom. And so what happens when Edward takes the throne, I think he was seven years old when he became the king of England. The, the kingdom was put under the control of protectors. And so there were different people who would be in charge of a different area of responsibility in the kingdom until Edward was ready to assume that authority. And so the responsibility of the church goes to Thomas Cramer. He becomes the protector of the church under Edward VI. And this kind of takes the shackles off of Thomas Cranmer, and he's able to start instituting a lot of these reforms that he's seeing happening in England, or in Europe, in England. And so we see all of the images are removed from the churches. The, the clergy stop wearing vestments. There's no longer holy water in the churches. Crucifixes are removed from the churches. And so you see a pretty drastic Protestantizing of the English church. In 1549, the first book of common prayer is introduced on the day of Pentecost. And it emphasizes the people's participation in the Eucharist, and it requires the Bible to be read from cover to cover. And so under the Roman church, the, the service was done in Latin. And when that, when that practice started, it was because Latin was the common language of the people. But as the language evolved, the service didn't. And so you got to a point where the majority of Christians had no idea what was happening in the church service. Um, and so they actually had bells known as sanctus bells that they would ring at certain points in the service so that the people in the congregation knew that something important was happening. Uh, and that's actually the, the magic words hocus pocus comes from the Latin mass. That, that's the Latin hocus corpus means this is my body. They would ring the bell, they would elevate the host, uh, and so the people thought, oh, hocus pocus, these are the magic words that turns the bread into the body of Christ. And so uh, Thomas Cranmer is getting away from that. He wants the people to understand. He wants the people to participate in the Eucharist. He wants the people to be able to receive the Eucharist, and he wants the people to be able to hear and read the Bible. In 1552, a second prayer book is introduced, and this, is revi this revision is done to suit Protestants. Um, and often people will say the 1549 prayer book was written in order to get to the 1552. So Cranmer understood enough that you don't change everything all at once. And he knew going from Latin into English was going to be a big change. And so he wanted to, to institute some of these Protestant reforms gradually. And so you get people used to 1549, and then you change more things in 1552. 
Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So, and again, he, he's taking out more uh, Romish practices, so no vestments, there's no more signing of the cross at confirmation, no holy oil, no reserved sacraments or prayers for the departed in the 1552 prayer book. <laughs> and one of the things you see in Anglican worship since the Reformation is there's kind of this back and forth that we always see between more Catholic practices and more Protestant practices. Uh, and different periods of the church have, have tended towards different extremes. And so for people to say, well, this is what Anglicans have always done, you can't say that because there's nothing that Anglicans have always done. Uh, at certain times in, English, in Anglican history, the church has looked much more Protestant. At other times in the history, the church has looked more Catholic. So unfortunately, Edward VI was a sickly boy. And in 1553, he died. Uh, and that leaves Mary Tudor. Uh, and Mary was the daughter of Henry and Catherine of Aragon. And because Catherine of Aragon was a staunch Catholic, Mary Tudor was also a staunch Roman Catholic, a militant Roman Catholic. And so when she becomes queen, she quickly begins persecuting the Protestants. Um, she reconciles with Rome. She appoints new bishops to the English church. She fires all the priests who are married. Um, and then in 1555, Mary burns Bishop Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley at the stake. Uh, so this was not just sort of a, a firing being mean to the the protestant she was killing the protestants and this is why she got the nickname bloody mary uh, now cranmer this put him in a difficult position as archbishop of canterbury because he felt as the archbishop he owed his allegiance to the monarch whoever that monarch was and so when mary took the throne uh, Cranmer initially recanted his Protestant beliefs because that's what Mary asked him to do. But he eventually repudiates his recantation. He says, I can't do this. This is the truth and this is what I need to abide by. My conscience won't allow me to go back. And because of that, Mary burns Cranmer at the stake as well. And the, the legend goes that as the flames started coming up, Cranmer puts his right hand in the end of the flame first because he wants the hand that signed his recantation to burn first. Uh, in 1558, Mary dies. And so, again, because the, the only male heir had died, now the oldest female heir dies, and that leaves Elizabeth, who is the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. And so she now becomes queen. <clears throat> and Elizabeth was what much more sympathetic to the Reformation than uh, Mary had been. Um, and really, if we want to talk about the birth of modern Anglicanism, it really doesn't come with Henry VIII. It, it's really Elizabeth I who is the mother of modern Anglicanism. So under her reign, we had the prayer book revised once again in 1559, and Elizabeth reintroduces the surplice, explaining that it is the clergyman's uniform. So the surplice, uh, it's, the, it's the long white outer robe that the priest wears over the cassock. Um, <clears throat> and in those days, the cassock was just sort of the normal day-to-day -day dress uh, of the priest, and so the vestment is the surplice that goes over top of it. So, um, so she settles the argument over over vestments. Uh, it's during Mary's reign in 1563 that the 39 Articles are drafted as a doctrinal statement by a convocation of the Church of England. And we talk a lot with Mary or with Elizabeth. Um, 
one of one of the difficulties of the position she found herself in was the church was a state church and so it's not like you know in springfield we have so many churches of so many different flavors that it's pretty easy to find a church that kind of lines up with with your own doctrinal beliefs uh, in england that wasn't the case everything was church of england and you had a lot of people in england who still favored the roman church you had others who were pushing for more reformation and so uh, elizabeth really had to figure out a way to balance a lot of these things out um, when we talk about the via media the middle way oftentimes people will say well it's a middle way between catholic and protestant but that's that's really not what the via media is about it's it's a balancing of lots of different positions even within the reformation uh, there were different voices in the reformation who had different understandings of, of several um, what they considered core doctrines and the early anglican church tried to take all of these things and kind of balance them and hold them in attention so that there was room for more people within the church so they would stop killing each other and be able to start worshiping together we then get into the era of puritanism so as i said you, you've got this pull from one side from the the roman um, Roman Catholics, you've got a pull on the other side from sort of the extreme Protestant and Anabaptist movements, and that's where we get the Puritans. In 1581, Richard Hooker is ordained as a priest, and his anti-Puritan book, Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, reflects natural law and rationalist ideas. Uh, I, I always find it interesting um that thanksgiving we always talk about how the, the pilgrims were so brave because they escaped the the tyranny of england so they could worship as they wanted and and as anglicans we always think well yeah they they didn't want to be anglicans <laughs> uh and so it's always funny when we when we have our our thanksgiving day uh prayer service and and we sort of remember back to these people that didn't want to worship like we worship. In 1604, the prayer book is revised once again. In 1611, we get the King James Version of the Bible. At this point, there were, um, there were two different translations of the Bible, uh, English translations that were being used in England. And so James wanted there to be one standard translation that everyone would use. And that's where we get the, the King James version of the Bible. So people who are King James only, we have to remind them that that came out of Anglicanism too. <clears throat> now we shift our attention to uh, the Americas, 1584 to 1776. In 1597, Francis Drake, an English privateer, lands in San Francisco Bay and conducts the first Anglican service in North America. So the Anglican church in North America dates back to the 16th century. So all the way back to 1597. In 1687, Anglican liturgy is introduced at South Church Boston on Good Friday. So we have a long history of Anglican worship in, in what is now the United States. And then we come to the origin of the Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States. Now, when <clears throat> America declaimed, or proclaimed indep declared independence from England, there was a problem. Because at this point, the Anglican Church is still the English state church. And all priests who are ordained are required to swear an oath of allegiance to the monarch. Well, that's not gonna fly in a new independent country that is trying to get away from English rule. Uh, but the English church will not consecrate bishops to go to the United States, which means 
they can't ordain more priests, they can't do confirmations. And so they're, they're basically holding the church in siege um, at this point. So Samuel Seabury in 1784 is the first American bishop, and he actually goes to the, the Scottish Episcopal Church to be consecrated bishop. Um, and so we owe a debt of gratitude to the Scots for allowing uh, apostolic succession to continue in the United States. Uh, in 1789, the first general convention of what was known as the, Pre the Protestant Episcopal Church of the United States of America is held. Um, now, the, that word Episcopal, because Anglican means English, they didn't want to call their church Anglican. And so they picked another descriptive term, an Episcopal comes from the Greek word episkopos, which means bishop or overseer. And so it literally just means instead of English church, it means church ruled by bishops. General convention is the gathering of um, clergy and laity of the church every three years to make decisions for the church. It's, it's the legislative meeting of the national church. And what's interesting, even today, if you look at the way general convention works, because this was set up around the same time as the American government was set up, they bear a lot of similarities. They have two houses, then the way they vote and the way they make decisions looks very similar to uh, how the United States Congress is set up. So then we have the history of the Episcopal Church. In 1892, a new U.S. prayer book is introduced, and then 1928, you get, again, another new prayer book, which reintroduces prayers for the departed, which had been taken out as too Romish. And then we sort of start to get the beginning of the end for the Episcopal Church. In 1960, James Pike becomes the Bishop of California. James Pike was an interesting character. Uh, and during the following years, he would do things like deny the virgin birth. He would deny the Trinity. He denied the incarnation. Um, he was going out into the desert and doing seances. Um, now, <laughs> to have a crazy bishop is not unique in the history of the church. But what makes Bishop Pike unique is that there are structures set up in the church to deal with rogue bishops, to deal with heretical bishops. And so Pike should have been brought up on charges for heresy, and he should have been defrocked and lost his orders. Um, but again, you know, when we talk about men of power, you've got this group of people that are essentially in charge of policing themselves. And they look at Pike and they see the goofy things he's doing. And they say, well, if we hold him accountable for that, <clears throat> I know I'm not perfect and they're going to come after me for the goofy things that I'm doing. So we'll look the other way on that and they'll look the other way on the stuff that I'm doing. Uh, and so what happens is you develop this culture in the house of bishops where you know that you are not going to be held accountable for what you do by the other bishops. So anything goes. And that is a dangerous, dangerous precedent to set for a group of people who the main job of the bishop is to defend the faith. So that, that attitude leads us to 1974. And in 1974, 11 women were ordained priests in Philadelphia without the authorization of general convention. So the way it should have happened legally, and this was, I think at this point, women could be ordained as deacons, but not as priests. Um, and what would have had to happen, you would have, it would have taken two votes at two separate general conventions to approve the practice of ordaining women to the priesthood. But a bishop said, nope, not gonna wait for it. 
I'm just going to do it. And he did. And no one called him out on it. And no one challenged the validity of the ordinations. And so that showed, again, that the clergy weren't going to be, bishops weren't going to be disciplining other bishops. Um, what it also did was it, it taught uh, bishops and clergy that the way to get things done in the Episcopal Church was not through general convention, but rather it was to start doing them. And then once you do it long enough, you can simply claim that it's normative and then you get general convention to approve it. And we'll see that later on with the sexuality debate. Uh, things like gay marriage and, and practicing gay clergy, this is not something that was approved before it was done. It was something that was done and then approved because everyone was doing it. And so they're, they're developing this playbook of how things get changed. Um, in 1979, there's a new prayer book that's introduced in the midst of all of this. And the 1979 prayer book is perhaps the most extensive revision of the prayer book since 1549. And, and there were some things that the 79 prayer book did well. There were other things that it did very poorly. Um, I think one of the most remarkable things of the 79 prayer book is that it introduced this very American concept of choice. So under all previous prayer books, you have one service for morning prayer, one service for evening prayer, one service for Holy Communion. It's very straightforward. You get to 1979 and suddenly you have right one and right two. Um, so different languages for services. And then within those two services, you have two Eucharistic prayers in right one and you have four Eucharistic prayers and write too, and then they give other options. And, and so it becomes, rather than this guide of this is how I do the service, it really becomes more of a resource of how to put together your own service. Uh, and part of what gets lost in the 1979 prayer book is this idea of common prayer, that we're no longer praying together. We're no, it, it used to be you could go into an Episcopal church anywhere in the country and get essentially the same service wherever you went. Suddenly, under the 79 prayer book, you could go into four churches in the same city and get four drastically different services. So now we get to the present day and the new Anglicanism. Um, so because of all these things that had happened in the Episcopal Church, um, and, and there was a lot of other things that played into it, but what you started seeing is this leftward drift, not only in the Episcopal Church, but in a lot of mainline Protestant Christianity. Uh, but because of the things that happened in the Episcopal Church, they were sort of on the forefront of a lot of these progressive innovations. And so once we get to 2000, we start seeing a little bit of pushback. <clears throat> so in 2000, bishops from Rwanda and Southeast Asia consecrate Chuck Murphy and John Rogers to become missionary bishops in the United States. And this is very unique because Historically, Anglicanism has operated as a geographical church. So you can't have more than one Anglican presence in any geographical region. And so to consecrate bishops to go into a region where there is already an Anglican presence is, that's just not what Anglicans do. Another thing that was a little weird about this is uh, Chuck Murphy and John Rogers were consecrated as bishops, but they weren't part of a province. They didn't have, they didn't sit in a house of bishops. They had no authority over them. And this, the organization that they created was known as the Anglican Mission in America. Uh, and this early DNA comes back to kind of bite them in the behind about 11 years later when the AMIA implodes because their bishops don't want to be under authority. But what we see here with this consecration is uh, 
that the, the global church is starting to respond to what is happening in the United States. And they're starting to realize that the old way of doing things isn't going to work. And the gospel needs to be preserved. So in 2003, the, uh, the consecration of Gene Robinson, really, this, this is a pivotal moment in not only the Episcopal Church, but the Anglican Communion. Uh, and Gene Robinson was the first openly practicing homosexual bishop to be consecrated. Now, he's, he is certainly not the first gay bishop. But he was the first one who was open about it. He was the first one who was engaged in a, in a homosexual relationship at the time. And so this caused a huge crisis within the Anglican Communion. And we won't, we won't really get into a lot of that right now. But at this point, there are a lot of um, conservative traditional Anglicans who are thinking, well, this is not the church of my youth. This is not the church I grew up in. I can't be a part of this church, but I still want to be an Anglican. I don't want to go be a Baptist. I don't want to go be a Presbyterian. So how do I remain Anglican in this context? And so there were lots of different things that were going on, um, but probably one of the biggest things was the Church of Nigeria, which is the largest province within the Anglican Communion. In 2006, they consecrate Martin Minns um, as a missionary bishop to the United States, and they form a group called CANA, which stands for Convocation of Anglicans in North America. And the big difference between Martin Minns and John Rogers and Chuck Murphy is Martin Minns is under authority. He is a, uh, a bishop in the Nigerian House of Bishops under the authority of the Archbishop of Nigeria. And so there were a lot of Anglicans that looked at that and saw that as a much more legitimate option than a couple of rogue bishops uh, in the United States who had no authority. And so a lot of churches start, and initially Cana was set up strictly for Nigerians living in the United States, but so many um, others in the United States saw this as a legitimate option that suddenly you saw churches leaving the Episcopal Church and coming under the authority of Cana. Uh, and that's exactly what my parish in Colorado Springs did. And actually All Saints started as a Cana parish under Martin Minns. Uh, around 2008-2009, we saw a number of full dioceses within the Episcopal Church leave the Episcopal Church. So the Diocese of Fort Worth, Diocese of Pittsburgh, Diocese of San Joaquin, Diocese of Quincy, all these dioceses left as entire dioceses. So suddenly you have this critical mass of traditional Anglicans in the United States. So in 2009, Robert Duncan, who was then the Bishop of Pittsburgh, is elected the first Archbishop of the Anglican Church in North America. And so what's happened is we've created essentially a parallel province in the United States, where for probably the first time in history since the Reformation, you have two Anglican bodies in, in the same geographic region. Uh, and the ACNA has tried to bring in all of these different groups that, that broke away from the Episcopal Church, even bringing in the Reformed Episcopal Church that left in the 1800s um, and forming a new Anglican province. And so the, the ACNA is currently seeking to bring together these many different groups to form this new cohesive whole. It's, uh, it's certainly a challenge. It's something that's not completed. It's still kind of messy, but it's exciting to be a part of something um, that is gospel centered and where everyone, we may have different ways of doing things, but, but at least we all feel like we're, we're working together on the same team you see this starting to happen in other parts of the country as well. There's something like this that's 
uh, currently in the fledgling stage in England as well. Uh, as far as our recognition in the communion, and we talked a bit about this in an earlier class, uh, the ACNA is not officially recognized by the Archbishop of Canterbury, but we are officially recognized by the majority of Anglican archbishops throughout the communion. Um, and I think really this is the beginning of what will ultimately be a permanent fracturing of the Anglican communion and how that all works out and how long that takes, uh, we do not know. So we will, we will wait and see what happens. <laughs>